the passion and the agony of our Savior Jesus Christ began in the Garden of Gethsemane on the Thursday night before he died. Immediately after the Last Supper with his apostles, in the upper room on Mount Zion, he went with them down to the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Gethsemane. And there, beneath the olive trees, with the Paschal moon shining in the sky, he knelt down and began his great high priestly prayer. The apostles knelt at some distance off, and they watched him as he prayed. And they saw great beads of sweat come on his sacred forehead, and it appeared like blood. And they were sleepy, some of them, and they went to sleep. And then after a little while, there was a noise of approaching men. And police came. And with the police was the traitor Judas Iscariot. And Judas advanced toward our divine Lord and planted on his cheek that hideous, poisonous serpent's kiss and said, Hail, Rabbi. And then our Lord was arrested and his hands were bound and he was taken and led off to Mount Zion, to where the palace of the high priest was. And in that palace was a large court, and there they began his trial. And then began his agony and his suffering. Now the passion of Christ is for us a very blessed and wonderful thing because it is only through his passion that we have any hope whatsoever of eternal life. In his passion, in his suffering, in his pains lies our redemption, lies our salvation. And so the passion for us is a good thing. And that is why we call this Friday, this black and terrible Friday of pain and passion, that is why we call it Good Friday. Because for us it is good. But it was not good for Jesus. Remember, our Lord was and is forever God. But our Lord in his, the days of his flesh was also perfect man. In other words, according to our holy Roman Catholic faith, our Lord was God and he was man. And his manhood was the same manhood that we have. As man, he was subject to the same limitations that we have. In other words, the fact that he was God did not save him from the horror of his pains and his passion. He felt pain just as much as we feel pain. If somebody whipped us over the back, we should feel intense and excruciating pain. And he felt that same kind of pain. So, what I'm trying to point out to you at the very beginning of this contemplation of the divine passion is that our Lord's sufferings were absolutely real. The passion for us is a blessed and glorious and good thing. But the passion for Christ was brutal and sadistic and savage and horror. The pains that he suffered were excruciating pains. 
pains unendurable by human flesh. He bore them all for our sake. Now our Lord, for the latter part of his ministry, had been surrounded by hate. They hated him. They hated him so much that they not only wanted to kill him, but they wanted to kill him with the utmost brutality that they could heap upon him. They wanted to accompany that brutality with every form of insult and humiliation. They wanted to load it on and make it costly. They were consumed by hate. The high priests and the leaders of the Jews. They wanted him out of the way, but they wanted him out of the way in a manner that can make it a hideous and horrible example for anybody else who came along and had messianic pretensions. So the passion was savage. It was black. It was horrible. It was terrible. On Monday, Thursday, as they led him, by the light of the Easter moon, up the slopes of Mount Zion, one can well imagine, the scripture tells us enough for us to fill in the gaps and see the sort of things that were happening. No doubt they tripped him as he walked along, and when he fell down, they would kick him and spit upon him. They would slap him across the face and make cruel jokes. If those of you who are men can think of all the obscene words that many of you hear at your work, the words that are used in the more dirty kinds of jokes, those are the words that they heaped upon him as they spat. When he looked around him, there were no sympathetic eyes at all. They were cold eyes of hate. And they were determined to make him suffer. Oh, how they were determined to make him suffer. There is a kind of wit that is known as the cat of nine tails. It is made out of leather bones. And there are nine separate whips in one. And when that whip is cracked across a person's back, it cuts and it sears and it draws blood. And it causes incredible pain. They whipped him with that sort of thing. Over his frail back, they whipped him, they whipped him, and they again whipped him. And they took him to the palace of the high priest. And there they taunted him. They made fun of him in his sufferings. They put a purple robe on him to signify loyalty. They put a crown of thorns upon his head. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they said it with hatred and scorn. And there he stood in his humiliation. They spat upon him. Already, from the nervous tension of it, nervous tension brings out sweat. He was sweating. As they pulled him and kicked him and lashed him up the hill. And his face was covered with spit and with sweat and with dirt. And they call into obscenity. That was the beginning of the passion. And remember, he was alone. He was alone. Where were his twelve friends? They were not there. Peter was there, we know that. But Peter was in the very back of the hall, looking after Peter. Peter was taking no risks. 
When a maidservant came up there in the hall of the high priest and pointed out to him and said, this is one of them, Peter said, I never knew that. Peter was very proud. That happened three times before the cop. So our Lord was there alone. You know, if when one is suffering, physical pain, or spiritual grief, or from extreme nervous tension, if one can have somebody who loves one with one, that eases the pain. All of our lives, we like to share our pains with somebody else. Somebody who loves us, somebody who cares. Little children, when they hurt their finger, come and ask mommy to kiss the finger. And the pain becomes less. Not because, of course, there's any magic in the kiss. But the mere fact that somebody cares, that eases the pain. But Jesus in his pain had nobody there. He was alone. He was alone with his enemies. He was alone with the, those who hated him. He was alone with their hatred. And their eyes were cold, cruel, hateful eyes. The passion was like that. And all through his passion, until the hour of three on that Black Friday when he died. Every possible pain was inflicted upon him and every form of humiliation. All of that Monday, Thursday night until Good Friday morning, he was pushed around like a stack of potatoes. He was kicked, he was bucketed, he was tripped up as he walked along. And when he was down on the ground, they kicked him. And they spat upon him. And they used obscene terms and slapped him across the face. They treated him as they would have treated a mangy dog. That was what the passion was like for Christ. That is the hideous, brutal savagery and reality of the passion. It was not a nice thing at all. It was not a thing that we can convince of conventional lives. It is not a thing as we can act, that we can accept as merely a doctrine of our faith. It is a doctrine of our faith, a fundamental and absolute one. But behind that is all that hideous pain, all the agony, all the humanity. And then, on Good Friday, when they had sentenced him, was that long and horrible walk bearing his heavy cross. And he fell down three times. And when he fell, that wasn't just the end of it. There were jeers, there were taunts, there was laughter, there was merriment at his expense. No doubt, those standing by and there enough gave him an extra kick. That is the way they behave on these hateful occasions. The Via Dolorosa, which leads from the judgment hall of Pontius Pilate to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where Calvary was. There's a hill that's it's on a hill, a slope that goes up like that. In the time of Christ, that slope was even steeper. But in the almost 2,000 intervening years, a great deal of rubble and debris has filled it up so that it's not quite such a slope. But it is a slope. And to bear a heavy cross up that slope was a terrible thing. Especially when the whip cracked over his back and drew blood. And then, the hour that we just commemorated, 12 o'clock, they put the cross down on the ground 
and he was put on the cross, and then in the palms of his hands were nails. In the chapel of Calvary, which is built on the mound of Calvary, where the crucifixion took place, just to the right of the main altar, which is the altar where the cross stood, there is another altar which has a mosaic behind it. Now up there it's very dark. And there are flickering candles. But when that altar over there is lighted for mass, you can see the scene that took place right on that very spot on that good Friday. Our Lord is lying upon the cross. And at his feet Kissing his feet is Mary Magdalene. She could not bear this. It tore her to pieces. She adored him. And she had to see him suffer and she could do nothing about it. But what she could do, she did do. She kissed his feet and adored him and sent from her heart every wave of love that she had in it. And there was the Blessed Mother. She was paralyzed. Paralyzed. She saw him who was her own flesh being torn and tortured before her eyes. And there the workman had his heavy mallet raised and was bringing it down to drive the nail through his palms. That was horrible, horrible, horrible. Just to look at that mural when I was there in that chapel tore my heart. I could hardly bear to look at it. I had to stop looking at it. It was too much. And then they raised up the cross. And that was just unthinkable horror. Because then all the weight of the whole body came upon those hands with the nails through them. And that horrible feeling of asphyxiation, of drowning in internal blood hemorrhage, came over. And then they stood around that crowd out for a spectacle, and they enjoyed themselves. Oh, how they enjoyed themselves. A triple crucifixion, because remember, there were two thieves on either side. That must have been a tremendous event in Jerusalem to have not one crucifixion, but three. And I dare say that hundreds and thousands perhaps poured out from the city. And they bought there, no doubt, there were hawkers going through the crowd selling the first century equivalent of Cracker Jacks and Pepsi Cola. And they stood there and they munched and they watched and they enjoyed. And they shouted catcalls at him. And they shouted obscenities. And they rushed up and spat at him. 